Welcome back, dear friends of the Sparker podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome you to a special episode with the exceptional explorer Bertrand Picard. It was my privilege to interview Monsieur Picard in front of a live audience at the Swiss Fintech Awards Night 2021, and Bertrand Picard shared his vast experience with us. We talked about risk-taking, moving the boundaries of the impossible and the power of the mind, just to name a few of the topics that we touched in our conversation. This conversation was recorded, as I mentioned, live on stage. And in the first, let's say, third of the interview, we had quite a significant rainstorm going on outside. So in the background, you will hear some white noise and throughout the interview, it will get better and better. Please enjoy this Sparker podcast episode with Bertrand Picard. For me, it will be now a personal highlight also to have this uh, conversation with our guest of honor, which is uh, Bertrand Picard. Of course, Monsieur Picard doesn't really need an introduction. That's kind of um, something you say quite often or hear quite often, but I'm pretty sure here it is really the case. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you all know him as the adventurer, explorer, as the also disruptor and entrepreneur who has many world records under his belt. He had the longest flight in human history um, with his orbiter balloon, how he circulated around the Earth. We also know Solar Impulse. Uh, in the last couple of years, he has also been uh, very much invested in the uh, sustainability technology area, looking for more than a thousand solutions, profitable uh, technological solutions, how you can deal with uh, the sustainability topic. And I'm very sure that there is a lot and a lot to uh, dig into and to have a conversation about. What I didn't mention, that maybe not many people know, he's also a psychiatrist and a hypnosis specialist. So there's so much in this person, and it will be my challenge and my privilege to use um, half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, to try to dig up all the gold that is in this person. So please welcome with me, Petro Pika. So I would like to start with the obvious. So you were born into, uh, you could almost say, a dynasty or into a family with explorers, with adventurers. And what um, your fascination for being very high up in the air, uh, I think that fascination started very early in your life. Can you please bring us back to that time where you realized that this is your passion, the being high up in the air? It was not necessarily high up in the air. It was to be an explorer like the people I met when I was a child. You know, I, I heard the stories of my grandfather going to the stratosphere. I was looking at my father diving with his submarine and being allowed to paint a little part of the hull of the submarine to work a little bit with my father. Okay, but this seemed completely normal because it was my family and it was the only thing I could see every day. And then suddenly, my father built a submarine for an American company who was working with NASA. So the entire family moved to the US. And when I was 10, I was reading books about the conquest of space, about pioneering of aviation. And in the next weeks, I met them all. You know, all the early astronauts from the American space program, uh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, Jacques Mayol, all these people were exploring and doing incredible things. And suddenly I thought, wow, I'm reading these stories in the book. The next day I'm, I am meeting them, I'm meeting them, and there is no gap between dream and reality. And it gave me suddenly the impression as a child that there was nothing impossible. And also these people, they were not superheroes. They were people who were taking the time to speak with me. You know, it's incredible. Guys who were going to the moon, 
And I was there talking to them, and they were explaining me what they were doing and why they wanted to do it. And this inspired me so much that I thought this is the type of life I would like to have. And I remember very well, it was in July 1969, my father made the dive in the submarine. I was invited by Werner von Braun to look at Apollo 11 taking off, and I thought, I want to be an explorer, nothing else. <laughs> nothing else, no chance that anything else would come up um, in your career. No, but you know, you're a teenager, you want to be an explorer, and then a week later, Neil Armstrong puts his foot on the moon, and you have the impression that everything has been done. <laughs> and you think, okay, I'm too late. <laughs> I'm too late. Yeah. I think many What's in this left? room might have this, uh, sometimes this feeling that with their innovation, their disruption, ah, we are too late. Yes. But it's not the case. No, you know what happened is that I developed a compass in my heart with a needle that was not showing the north, but showing the unknown and everything that had not yet been achieved. And this needle was just pushing me in different ways. And, uh, well, the first thing, nobody had gone down the balcony of my house with a rope. <laughs> so I tried to do it and was stuck in the middle because of a, a nut in the, in the rope. And I was screaming and my father had to put chairs above tables to, 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 to take me, to recover me, and thought, okay, that's not very successful. <laughs> but second time, it was a hang glider flying in the sky of Switzerland, one of the first ones that was important in Switzerland, and I thought, okay, that's for me. And then microlight, in the beginning, there's a guy who called me, I got the first microlight in Switzerland, I think it's for you, so I went and tried it. And then uh, a friend invited me to cross the Atlantic in a balloon, and I was not a balloonist, but he wanted me because I was a hypnotherapist. And he was afraid of this flight. <laughs> you know, it's five days and five nights from America to Europe above the Atlantic Ocean, and he thought I would be his secret weapon to win the race, to manage the sleep, manage his anxiety, manage the cold, the heat, and... and and we won the race. Yeah. And we won the race. And that showed me how great ballooning can, could be. And then I went into Breitling Orbiter project, creating this project from nothing. And well, you know, it's you you have the, the you have the spirit, and then you adapt the spirit to everything you do. But you don't know in advance what you're going to do. I never thought I would go around the world in a balloon. I never thought I would go around the world in a solar-powered airplane. When I was dreaming at 11 years old, there was no solar power to fly around the world. But you have to be ready. You have to be ready for everything. And then you, you see, you check, do I like it or not? I, I think the only thing I did not try in life is drugs, because I think the benefit is not enough. So I didn't try that. But beside that, I tried a lot of things, and it worked, it didn't work, I liked it, I did not like it, and it just made me going through life until now. That's uh, super fascinating. I didn't know that you met all these uh, big heroes, the astronauts, as a, as a teenager. Um, now looking back of all these explorers or adventurers, astronauts that you met, and also from your own life, how would you, uh, do you see a pattern of kind of personalities or personality traits that you admire? I mean, you could say astronauts, I'm sure they are courageous. Maybe that's the thing you admire. Maybe it's something else. What, what is it that um, gravitated you towards these explorers? Well, I love the people who do things that are considered to be impossible. Uh, I met uh, Edmund Hillary, the first guy on the Everest. No, I, it's unbelievable because now you have thousands of people to go to the Everest. But when he did it, nobody had gone there. Although the Everest mountain was in front of the Nepalese and the Tibetans for thousands of years, but it was prohibited to profanate the holy mountain. And then you have somebody who comes and breaks the rules and say, I don't care, it's not a holy mountain, it's a block of ice and rocks and I'm going to get on top of it. And this guy changed the paradigm. 
And in the astronauts, it was also interesting to see that most of them were test pilots. The Mercury, Gemini astronauts, they were test pilots. You, maybe you've seen the right stuff. It's a fantastic movie. And they, they just wanted to do the things as well as they could and so on. But my preferred astronaut, it was Scott Carpenter. Scott, Carp Scott Carpenter from the Mercury program is the only one who admitted that he enjoyed it. <laughs> you know, it's strange, but all the other guys, they went there and said, I had the job to do, I did it well, and I succeeded. And Scott Carpenter was up there in orbit, and he was telling by radio, it's beautiful, I love it, and I enjoy it. But the problem is he enjoyed it so much that he missed the landing by 400 miles, <laughs> and then he was kicked out of NASA because he was not perfect. But he was the one I preferred. And he's the guy who came for my birthday when I was 12 years old and uh, explained me all that. And I thought, wow, that's a real human being. He admits that he enjoys looking at the Earth from above. The others were too much military. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it sounds to me like if you dare to uh, conquer the impossible, you shouldn't aim for perfection. That's not the goal. Or you shouldn't aim for the record or whatever. No. It's more about... Um, enjoying it. En enjoying the, the achievement you, you have yes. achieved. Yeah. Okay. And um, when we look at this uh, moving the needle or moving the boundaries and make something that was impossible so suddenly possible, uh, what, what's the fine line between somebody being a lunatic and being a visionary? Well... What happens here? First, you have to understand that the impossible does not exist in the reality. The impossible exists in the mindset of the people who believe that the future will be similar to the past, which is completely wrong because the future is always disruptive. So you need to be disruptive also. You need to be ready to believe exactly the opposite from what you have learned. You need to be ready to do things that have never been done. So you need to learn something else than what you already know. And how do you learn that? There are two ways. One is to be with people who are different from you, because they will teach you other ways to think, and they will challenge you. And instead of saying, no, no, I am right and you are wrong, you have to do the opposite. You have to think, what if they were right? What would change in my way of thinking? What would change in my life? If I start to think differently, maybe my trajectory in life will not be like this, it will be like this. And this is precisely the direction I want. And then the, the second thing is, is, is to try. Is to try. There are so many people who are just afraid of trying something new because people will laugh at them if they fail. So I had a big, big chance. I was lucky enough to fail dramatically once, have everybody laughing at me, and since then, I did not care anymore. People can laugh as much as they want. I learned something. <laughs> I just learned that the people who laugh are the ones who don't dare to try. And the ones who laugh, they sign their own stupidity. So it's very dangerous to laugh at people. So what was my biggest failure? It was the first attempt to fly around the world in the Brightling Orbiter balloon. Richard Branson had failed. Steve Fossett had failed. A lot of them had failed. And I was trying for the first time with my brand new balloon. And I made a press conference, and I said, I'm going to fly and succeed three weeks in the jet streams around the world. And after six hours in the air, I ditched in the Mediterranean Sea with a technical problem. And since that moment, I felt completely free to do what I wanted to do, to fail as much as I wanted. Nothing could touch me more than that. But on the spot, I tell you, I was crying like a child, my eldest daughter didn't dare to go to school because she said, Daddy, my friends are going to make fun of me. <laughs> and I said, let them laugh. 
I failed. It's my mistake. Let them laugh. So she said, okay, so I go to school. <laughs> and she went and came back and said, no, no, it was, it, it was okay. No, no, they didn't laugh so much. I explained them what you did. And, yeah, th- well, you know, it's, it's, at the end, it's a human experience that you have to translate into your actions every day. Yeah, and I think it's very, very valuable to learn early on that it's okay to be different. It's yes. okay to be weird. Or yes. um, that, that is kind of a shield that, uh, that you dare to do the impossible later on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, you mentioned now this first try with your Orbiter uh, 1 balloon. And you, you said it yourself, you, you failed. No, it was not Orbiter 1. I, no, okay. It was Orbiter. Okay. Orbiter. Because we did not know there would be number 2 and 3. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. So, uh, the Orbiter and you had this crash. It was, uh, for you, um, a big failure. And you... You described it as a liberating feeling. Um, how were you able to kind of maybe translate that also to your team members? I mean, everything you do is not an effort for your own. You have um, team members, somebody who also believes in the vision. And how did you or you as a team manage this setback or this failure? How did you get no. back on track? What was the pep talk, so to speak, that you gave them? My, really my... Motto was, don't fail twice for the same reason. So always change something in the strategy or the technology. So because we had a technical problem on the first flight, on the second flight, I took a flight engineer with me. I took actually the guy who built the capsule. And we we went further. But we had a problem not having the Chinese uh, permission to fly above China. So we made a world record in duration, nine days in the air, but had to land in in Burma. So the third time, I changed completely the balloon, and I asked to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology if they could study how to get a longer endurance. Because the longer you can fly, the more opportunities you have to take the different winds. And the EPFL told me, look, your balloon was built to be well insulated at night. But it's wrong. It has to be better insulated for the heat of the day, not for the cold of the night. And we made a completely different balloon. And this balloon could double the duration of flight. And no other competitors of ours understood that. And even Richard Branson, he had a balloon who was much bigger than mine, three times more expensive, using a lot of gas, but after 10 days, he had no gas. And we could fly 20 days with a balloon that was smaller, just because it was more efficient. And you, if we speak about the Solar Impulse Foundation and all the solutions later on, you will notice that the word efficiency is really the master word in everything I want to promote. Be efficient. Just use less resources to have a better result. And uh, for... Brightling Orbiter 3, it was the most efficient balloon, and this is why we succeeded. Excellent. I believe you also mentioned Richard Branson as a competitor. Um, could you please ex- explain to us why you believe that, even though he had more resources and was more, yeah, larger team and all of that, why didn't he um, break the record and achieve it? What's the difference? Yeah, you know, Richard Branson wanted to have done it. I wanted to do it which is very different. You need to enjoy doing what you do. You should not just do something to have one more record in your, in your bio. And um, he was very busy, so he subcontracted everything. And he jumped in the balloon when everything was ready. So he didn't see that the balloon was badly built, badly designed. And um, once he, he... Just to show you... He called my, my weatherman and he said, I give you twice the salary you have with Picard if you come to work with me. No, if you work, if you come to work for me, he said, work for me. And my weatherman answered, I don't want to work with, uh, sorry, I don't want to work for anybody and not for you. I want to work with. And with Bertrand, I work with him. We work together. I'm not working for him. And he refused to join Branson, although it was much more money. 
So, so the, the team spirit was made differently in, in my team. It was a smaller team. We were friends. We were working together, sharing the problems and sharing the glory. I think there's a little anecdote also hidden in your relationship with that weatherman, I believe. Uh, could it be that you were up in the air, you wanted to double the speed, double the height or something like that, and you had a dispute with your weatherman? No, could it was not a dispute. Story? Not a real dispute, but it was really funny. Because <laughs> he told me, you have to fly at 6,000 meters altitude and about 40 or 50 miles per hour. And if you calculate 45,000 kilometers at 45 miles per hour, it doesn't work with the amount of gas we had. So I tried another altitude, and I found 120 kilometers per hour. And I was so proud, and I called him, and I said, look, you know what, I'm a really good pilot, you know? I found an altitude where the speed is almost three times what you predicted. And he told me, you know what? If you fly too fast, you're going to move in front of the low-pressure system and you're going to be kicked to the North Pole. <laughs> so the question I'm asking to you, so-called good pilot up there, he, he told me, is the following question. Do you want to go very fast in the wrong direction or slowly in the good direction? Yeah. <laughs> and this is the first time I understood what sustainability means. This was clearly about sustainability. You can go very fast in the wrong direction and you fail, or you go slowly, but you remain at the right altitude. You just go along with a low-pressure system, and at the end, you succeed. But yeah. it was not a dispute. At the end, I was laughing on the sat phone and telling, look, you are just incredible. I will comply with what you say. And... Uh, And we stayed exactly in the right direction, and we could respect the permission of China for the third flight exactly on the good entry point. You know, playing with the winds is something difficult, and Luke Tolmans was one of the best weathermen in the world. Uh, I think it's very impressive that how you explain that you have your crew on the ground, you are in this tiny capsule, in that instance, in the orbiter capsule, and... Even on your very successful flight, where you made the records and you achieved uh, your vision, there were these very um, difficult decisions you had to make, I'm sure. So I believe that there was this moment in this tiny capsule, I don't know if it was freezing cold or hot, or just, I can't imagine to be in such a small, uh, confined space for such a long time. No, it's and easy to be in a small space when you know that outside it is minus 50 degrees. Yeah, that's pretty comfortable. You want to stay inside. You don't want to go outside, I tell you. Yeah, that pretty, sounds pretty comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So um, now I, I believe you had this moment where you were over Mexico. And ahead of you was the Pacific. The Atlantic. Had, uh, sorry, the Atlantic, yeah. Um, and the Pacific, we had just done it. Yeah, you went the Mexico, other way around. And then the Atlantic. Yeah, true. You went the other way around. Sorry for that. So um, you, again, you had bad weather. Um, the, the fuel you had left, just from simply rationally calculating it, it didn't look too good for the success of the mission. No, it I was believe. miserable. Yeah. We And were, then, we, how do you still, what happens in your mind? That we you were come exhausted. We did a wrong manipulation with my friend Brian Jones, with whom uh, I, I was flying. And wrong manipulation with a scrubber of CO2. So there was too much CO2 in the other. In the, in the capsule, we were suffocating. The wind changed. We were pushed at low speed to the South Atlantic, Venezuela and South Atlantic. And uh, we had one-eighth of the fuel reserves to do the last quarter of the world. So if you calculate, it doesn't match. <laughs> yeah. And then we had the fax. It was fax in the time, not emails from Steve Fawcett, who said, you made a wonderful flight until now. I wish you a safe landing in Mexico. <laughs> and we were thinking, fuck you, Steve. <laughs> and, and then, what, what, what could we do? You know, basically, in a balloon, your only degree of freedom is the altitude. If you change your altitude, you can find winds that have a better direction. So, although it was very, very expensive in terms of propane to 
climb, it was the last chance. And I started to heat up the balloon, use a lot of propane, and each time you hear, you know, this is less propane for the Atlantic. But it was a gamble to do, and we're going up, and I called my wife on the sat phone, and I said, we are really in trouble. And I was going up, I said, it's the last chance. We will see what happens. And I was live with her on the phone, really in despair. And in the last 100 meters the balloon could reach, the direction changed 24 degrees to the left. And we're back on track. And uh, we hit a jet stream that took us like a rocket across the Atlantic. So we ended up with 40 kilos of fuel left out of the 3.7 tons from the start, and it was just enough. That, just enough. That's just, you said it. It's... But you know why we took the decision with Brian? We, we spoke about it. Because in advance, we said, we are, we are explorers. We're not daredevils. So what is the risk that we accept? We did not accept the risk to die. We both had a family. We did not accept the risk of being permanently handicapped, tetraplegic, paraplegic, or whatever. But we accepted the risk to be cold, hot, hungry, thirsty, wet, anxious, uh, to break a leg or to break an arm. That was okay. We had decided in advance. So when we had to decide to cross the Atlantic, before we hit the jet stream, we did not know if we would really reach the other side. But we were talking about it and said, we cannot imagine that we would live the rest of our life thinking we landed in Mexico, maybe it was not the good decision, maybe we would have had enough fuel to cross the Atlantic, and we did not dare to try. So we called the control center that was in Geneva for Breitling Orbiter 3, and we said, we don't care about the fuel, we go for it. And it was the only decision you, you could take. We were, we were not in an administration limiting the risk. We were explorers and we had to succeed. And maybe we would have ditched. Okay, we would have ditched. But it's better to ditch than to land stupidly in Mexico uh, when we could have tried to go further. Yeah, when you're in this so difficult situation, facing uncertainty, risk, danger... What is it that, that helps you? Is it courage? Is it kind of um, an inner assurance, trust that everything will be okay? I could imagine that your background as a psychiatrist or a hypnotis, uh, hypnosis specialist helped very much in such a situation. Can you maybe tell us what helps in such an uh, extreme situation to keep your, your calm and your mm. focus? I think it's not so much the courage, it's the confidence which is different. With courage, you can go despite your fear. But what is really interesting is the moment where you are in such a bad situation that you're obliged to get all the skills and the resources from inside. And you find them. This is confidence. It's when you don't rely anymore to the outside world because the out outside world doesn't give you the, the answers that you need. You rely because you're obliged to rely on yourself. You rely on what you find inside of you. And inside of you, you have the awareness you need. You have the concentration. You have the performance. You have the skills. Uh, you have all the memories also of the training you did. You know, if we had ditched in the Atlantic, we would have used the training we did for ditching. And we would have survived. So the... The moment of rupture, you know, the crisis, obliges you to choose between being a victim or an, or an actor. If you think you're a victim, you fail. If you understand that you're an actor of the situation, then you just try to do what you have to do with the skills that you find inside of you. And it gives you so much confidence when you find what you look for. And this is not just for Brian Jones and for myself or for André and me with Solar Impulse. It's for all of us. All of us. Each time we're in a crisis, and we went through a crisis last year, and all of us here also in finance, we all go through crises with crash, uh, financial problems, difficulties, change of regulation, political decisions, the, the end of the bank secrecy, or 
All these things, they're all crises. And we can stop, cry, and say we are lost, or we can say, okay, what can I learn from it? And this is why I, I love to say that an adventure, it is a crisis that we accept. And a crisis is an adventure that we refuse. And it's up to us to choose. Uh, and I, I love that, that phrase. An adventure is a crisis that you accept yeah. and, and work with. What, what, how do you build this um, inner strength? I mean, you mentioned training, of course. That's, I think, some, something everybody can relate with. The more I train, the better I will be in facing a critical mm. situation. But what about, for example, not panicking or just keeping your mental strength? How can you build or how can you train that kind of muscle, so to speak? I had ex an experience where I would have died if I had panicked. I was flying a hang glider for an aerobatic demonstration in an air show in France. And my hang glider exploded in the air. The wing completely disintegrated. I started to go into a spin with all the pieces of metal and wires hitting my face. I had blood all over the face. I couldn't see well what was happening. And I was falling really fast and thinking, I'm going to hit the ground and die. And at this moment, I had a, like a moment of grace, you know, of complete awareness, where I thought, okay, I'm here in the sky, I have to do something, and I'm going to do it well. Maybe there was also a big help of my garden angel. But the spin stopped, not because the glider stopped to spin, but because I got the center of myself in the middle, I saw not my glider spinning, but the horizon spinning, and I had the impression to be completely still. It was really a moment of pure awareness, and I found the handle of the parachute, I could throw it away, I could pull the rope to untangle it from the wing, and it opened and I could land. And that was really the moment I felt I can die or survive if I panic or if I do the right things. And since this moment on, I used hypnosis to train myself for moments of crisis in order really to be sure not to panic. So I was visualizing in a hypnotic trance what would need to be my reaction if the balloon was exploding, if there was fire on board, if I had to put the dry suit, put the parachute, jump in the middle of the night over an ocean and things like that, in order to be sure that if the situation would really happen, I would do the right things without panic. And, and I think it's very important to visualize what we can do in the future being calm. Okay, very, very fascinating. I'm glad that you kept your calm, that you can still be here with us for this <laughs> uh, very inspiring conversation, at least for me it is. Um, something that I would like to uh, get into is... Um, Maybe you could call it a life principle. At least it's something that I believe to observe, which is on the one hand, for example, in your balloon, but I guess also with solar impulse, you, um, you need to go with the wind. You go with the flow, so to speak. That's the, the saying. But on the other hand, you are such a strong character with, a, um, uh, with willpower, with perseverance and so on. And here you could say, here you need to kind of conquer the wind, or you need to prevail against the wind. How can this contrast come together of, on the one hand, you're completely uh, required to go with the wind, but on the other hand, you need to achieve your goal. How can you, how can you harmonize that contrast? As long as you keep the same flight level, you can never change your direction. The wind is taking you at the speed of the wind in the direction of the wind. And you cannot change it. But if you want to change your direction, you have to remember that the atmosphere is made out of a lot of different layers, which all have a different direction and a different speed. So if you want to go more to the left or more to the right, you have to fly higher or lower. In other words, you have to change altitude if you want to change your direction. And this is a metaphor For, for life. Because in life, we are pushed by the winds of life. We are pushed by so many things. You know, the, just a small virus 
is changing completely our life. And we cannot do anything against it, except changing altitude. That means try to psychologically, philosophically, or spiritually change our way of thinking, change our way of doing. And if we change altitude in our vision of the world, we will find other influences, we'll find other solutions, other strategies, other answers that will necessarily reorient our life in another way. So changing altitude is really important. And how do you change altitude? In a balloon, you throw out all your ballast. And in life, you throw out your, certain, your certainties, your habits, your beliefs, your paradigms, your convictions, you know, all the things that keep you at the same level. So when you hear that we have to follow the people who have a lot of certitudes and strong convictions, it's wrong. It's very dangerous to follow people like this because they are on a single direction, at a single altitude, and they will not change anything. So it's dangerous. You have to follow people who have doubts. I'm not saying hesitations. I'm saying doubts. People who are always thinking, maybe there is, no, there is another altitude, maybe there is another way to think, maybe there is another direction that could be better. And then they challenge themselves, they challenge the team, they challenge the solutions until they find a better altitude and a better direction. And for me, this is the definition of creativity, innovation, crisis management, entrepreneurship. Even art is like this. If you want to create a masterpiece in art, you should change your altitude. You cannot be mainstream. If you are mainstream, you are just going to make a beautiful reproduction of something that already exists. But if you change altitude and you throw out all your ballast, or at least a part of it, then you will create a masterpiece. That, that notion of the paradigm shift, yes. I, I think this is happening also with your current endeavor. Is that correct? You, I think it was once called a thousand solutions, but now you overshoot uh, the thousand solutions. Yes. You are, um, I think you're also looking for this paradigm shift in sustainable technology yes. and how to address the sustainability crisis. Yeah. What is happening there? Yes. The, what is the paradigm about protection of the environment since 50 years? It's about the fact that protecting the environment is financially expensive, that it is boring, that you have to threaten the lifestyle of the people, you ask them to go for sacrifice, to reduce mobility, to reduce comfort, to reduce lifestyle, to reduce consumption, to reduce growth. And this is what we hear since a long time. Does it pay out? Not so much. It creates resistance. If you speak of protection of the environment to heads of states, they tell you, yes, we should do it, but it's too expensive. If you speak about it to a big business leader who has 10,000 salaries to pay at the end of the month, he says, yes, we should do it, but we cannot afford it. Okay? So change the paradigm. Make protection of the environment financially profitable, exciting, requiring no sacrifice, and offering the best business opportunities. This is the change of paradigm. So maybe it can seem completely stupid to take exactly the opposite of the mainstream, but nevertheless, this is what I did. And I launched the challenge that was just after flying around the world with Solar Impulse, just on solar energy. I launched the challenge of having the Solar Impulse Foundation identify 1,000 technological solutions that would be financially profitable to protect the environment. And here again, you cannot imagine how many people told me it was impossible. They said, it's not profitable to protect the environment. And then we found 100 solutions. And I heard people who said, we made the calculation, you cannot find more than 300. Because 300, I don't know where it comes from. It's maybe the fields where there are problems. I don't know what. I, I, anyway, I didn't care. And, and we continued. And last April, 13th of April, we reached 1,000 solutions. Now we have 1,200. And because success is calling for success, we have even more, much more companies, big corporations or startups or medium-sized companies who are bringing their 
solutions. It can be a process, it can be a source of energy, it can be a technology, a product, a material, a device. But they all actively protect the environment, they create jobs, and they make profit. And we have a certification by Ernst Young to be sure that the certification process is reliable. We have around 400 external experts who are assessing these solutions. And today, we have 1,200 proofs that the protection of the environment is more profitable than the destruction of the environment. And the 1,200 proofs are of where to invest and what are the business opportunities of the century. Because a lot of these solutions, they are in a startup and nobody knows about them. And people continue to waste, to be inefficient, to pollute, to overconsume it, just because they don't know that technologies exist to do better. Just give you an example. When you have the chimney of a factory, what do you see coming out of it? Smoke. Who understands that it's not only smoke, it's also heat? Well, there is a small startup in France who recovers the heat from the factory, stores it, gives it back to the factory. They reduce by 20% the energy bill of the factory, and they create jobs, and they make profits by selling the system to the factory. And you have hundreds of thousands of factories in the world. Huge business opportunity. And it protects the environment, and it's efficient, and it's profitable. So, and there is 1,200 of them exactly like this. Where can people find the ideas? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a non-for-profit foundation. Everything is open. You can go on solarimpulse.com and you can see all these solutions. It's organized under the type of sustainable development goal that it is touching. And now we're working on preparing a guide where you can ask the questions and get the answers you need. And the next uh, step is for the COP26 in Glasgow in November. It's to have what we call the clean print. The clean print is the calculation of the economical profit and the ecological profit or benefit that a country can gain by using these solutions on its territory. And uh, we are preparing that for Scotland because the COP26 will be in Glasgow. But we're also having this ready for big corporations, for investors, for other governments, in order to, you know, to, to use these solutions because there is not one solution that will make the miracle. But the miracle is the fact that there are so many solutions. This is a miracle. And it's a bit like the piranha. The, I, I love that theory of the piranha. You know these little fish in the rivers in South America? If you go in a river and one of these fish bites you, you hardly feel it. But if you have 1,200 of them who come and bite you, you are a skeleton in three minutes. <laughs> and this is what these solutions have to do against pollution, against climate change, just used everywhere, they will solve a big part of the problem. It's super fascinating. So exactly that happened, what I feared would happen, that time flies and there would be so much more that I would like to ask you and to, have, um, to just keep this conversation going forever. However, slowly but surely we uh, need to, to close it and I think that's a beautiful place to do so. But just one or two things are still there to ask. Um, and what I'm always curious is people like you who have experienced so much, who have dared so much, you have heard a lot of advice or things you should do, not do. Um, what kind of the advice did you hear frequently that is just completely wrong? Usually I don't listen so much to the wrong advisors. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. what, what could I... Yeah, that, that was a, a discussion I had a lot with Audrey Borchberg, uh, who was my partner for Solar Impulse. He wanted to always plan everything. And for me, planification 
is a little bit the wrong advice. Because everything changes before you can implement the plan. So why do you plan? <laughs> so I was telling Audrey, stop to plan. Just wait for life to show us what we have to do. And he was telling me, but I cannot do that with the team. The team will become crazy because if we don't plan, they will not know what to do. So we came up to a one plus one equals three solution, you know, him, me, and both of us. So we were telling to the team, this is the plan. In two months, six months, one year, two years. But you have to know that this plan is worth nothing because everything will change. <laughs> so we took a part of him, a part of me. And I think all the people who want to plan everything, for me, it's the wrong advice. What you need to do is to be, to, to be listening to what life is doing what life is saying, what other people are saying. You need to be sensitive to, to what happens. And then you see where the direction goes before it's too late. Hopefully, before it's too late. Otherwise, you fail. Planification or no planification. <laughs> is that the thing that you tell or give to your daughters as advice when... When yes, well, they, they, they saw me working like that uh, since they are born. And I always installed the, the doubt about the certitudes. Never imagine that what you learn is the only truth. And when they were coming from school, I was telling them, asking them, what, what did you learn today? And they were very proud and they told me, this is what we learned and so on. I said, okay, very good. What would a child from another religion, another culture, another continent, or another time in history think about what you have learned? And then they understood that they would, under, they would have learned exactly the opposite. You know, it's, even history is completely different if you come from Israel or Palestine, if you are French or German, if you are Swiss or whatever. History is different. The culture is different. The facts are understood in a different way. So at the end, you always have to challenge everything. And I told them, ask all the questions. Maybe this is the biggest gift I received in my childhood. I was al always allowed to ask questions and to challenge everything. So I was a nightmare for my teachers because I never accepted to do something if I could not understand why I had to do it. But it brought me to be curious, to challenge everything. And, and my children are like this, and they challenge me. And when I tell them something and they don't agree, they tell me, and we have big discussions. But the motto of my children now is pioneering spirit for life. <laughs> so I like it. <laughs> There's nothing that I would like to add to that. It has been a gift for me to ask the questions to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for staying with us. And to all of you, I hope you keep having a great evening. We will continue with our dinner and it has been a great pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. It was really nice. Thank you. Thanks again to adventurer and explorer Bertrand Picard for sharing his deep insights with us. For more exciting conversations with leading minds in technology, innovation and entrepreneurship, please consider subscribing to the Sparker podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your favorite shows. There you'll find, for example, a conversation about how to become more creative in your work or how to build your personal and professional resilience with tips from a leading stress researcher and psychiatrist. I'm looking forward to welcoming you back to another episode soon, where I'll uncover the mindsets, tactics and insights of exceptional people and organizations to enable you, the change makers. It was a great pleasure having you with me in this episode. I wish you a great day and talk to you soon.